Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, if you guys could help us by letting us know in the chat if you can see the screen and if you can hear us okay, that would be very helpful. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, my name is Anna Taylor. I am the Government Liaison Administrator here in District 5. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, here in the District Office, we have Director Loreen Bobo from our Executive Management Team. From the Planning and Environmental Management Office, we have Kelly Smith, um, Heather Chazé, and Kathy Owens, as well as Tina Williamson and Steve Sham. Um, in our program management office, we have Kathy Alexander and Lisa Busher. Um, today, we are going to go through uh, several items. We expect it to last about an hour and a half. Uh, the webinar today is being recorded for future viewing, and the presentation materials are available to you in the handout section. Kathy's going to clear. There you go. Um, all topics that are being discussed today, um, we encourage questions and uh, comments. Those can be submitted via the chat, and they will be addressed after each section um, by the presenter. Uh, we're going to start with a state of the district and then get right into work program cycle expectations. Um, reviewing the NEPA checklist requirements, as well as the District 5 lab guidelines, and we'll close out with um, overall question and answers um, at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Director Bobo for the State of District 5. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, my name is Lorraine Bobo, and I'm the Director of Transportation Development for FDOT District 5, um, covering nine counties in Central Florida. Just wanted to give everybody a little bit of an update on District 5. Um, uh, Interim Secretary Jared Perdue has been with us since the end of 2019 as we look to um, hire a permanent district secretary. Um, we anticipate the interviews for that position um, in the coming weeks, and so hopefully by the end of February we will have a permanent uh, district secretary. Um, we really have appreciated um, Secretary Purdue's leadership over these last few months. Um, I also wanted to share with you um, uh, State FDOT Secretary uh, Kevin Tebow's Vital Few. So this is his kind of our his vision for FDOT as, as we move forward. Um, and those Vital Fews are, Vital Few are attract, retain, and recruit, which is an internal um, kind of goal of making sure we're attracting the right people to the department, keeping them and retaining them. Um, and I would imagine that this is probably a similar struggle for um, many out there, whether you're on the private side or the public side. Um, improved mobility, um, and this goes to not just uh, roadway projects, but Everybody that uses our facilities, whether they be pedestrians, uh, bicyclists, um, drivers, um, transit, and anybody in between. Increased innovation. Uh, this kind of goes to what are all the different ways that we can continue to improve the way that we do business, um, looking for innovative ways, um, to, things to implement within our projects whether it's processes, whatever it may be, we've, we've asked all of our teams to really work on ways to continue to improve. Um, improved safety is the last one. We can always do a little bit better. So what do we keep doing? What do we, what do, we do in our projects? Um, what do we implement for new ideas? Um, bring whatever we can to the table to improve safety on our, on our roadways. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Kathy Alexander here in a minute to talk about the work program development cycle, but 
this has really been an effort to get everybody on the same page when it comes to um, deadline expectations. Uh, our goal is to use this work program development cycle um, uh, layout uh, year after year. So it, nobody should be surprised as we come up on deadlines that this is when things um, are due. And with the ultimate goal that we're building and implementing the right projects at the end of the day. And we can do that by continuing to collaborate together. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. All right. Thanks, Lorraine. All right, good afternoon. So the objective of um, what I'll be presenting today is of, is of our programming expectations. And that's what you see here on this slide on the left-hand side. It is a little bit difficult to see, but I'll give you some information a little bit further down. Um, so the objective of the programming expectations is to set the playbook of activities, the corresponding length of these activities, and the key dates as it relates to the development of our tentative five-year work program. Today I'll be highlighting a few of those expectations as well as the activities and the key dates for you. In a little while, Lisa Busher will be sharing information about District 5's LAP guidelines. This same exhibit is included in the guidelines as an Appendix 2, so it's available to you for a more in-depth review as you're reading through that. Over the last year and a half, we heard from many of you about the need to establish a central source of expectations and due dates when it comes to coordinating project needs with the district. That feedback was mutually supportive to our observation that a gap existed in documentation of this process. Internally, we also saw the need to improve work program stability by properly vetting project, projects and their requests and the funding options prior to programming deadlines that are set by FDOT work program calendar. And we felt a timeline of the activities was needed so that we can sort and coordinate with all of our partner agencies on the project needs. Another key activity that was vital to our partners was to reestablish project intake meetings. To be able to discuss the specifics of project application information and offer more insight on the programming options based on a reviewed scope, schedule, and estimates will help reduce the risk of changes or incomplete or improper funding prior to programming deadlines. These are just a few of the examples of the feedback that we received and we have incorporated into our improved process. For the most part, this exhibit follows what we have been doing each year in collaboration with you, our partner agencies. The benefit this year is that we are formalizing the process and publishing it so that we understand where we are and what's expected when setting the expectation of the district and our partners so we can properly program and successfully deliver projects. So just to highlight a few of these dates for you, July 1st is going to be our first critical date. This is a due date to submit items to the district for the upcoming development cycle. We'll take applications on the priority list up to this date for programming in the upcoming tentative five-year plan. This date is important because all subsequent activities have been laid out against it to ensure that we have the time to coordinate what is needed prior to programming deadlines. We don't expect you to wait until July 1st to submit the information. Actually, submitting it earlier is going to be of greater benefit because we could start coordinating sooner and allow for more time to review and exchange the information. The month of July is going to be primarily internal FDOT coordination in order to work our way through the information that has been submitted. In early August is when all the coordination activities rev up. We're going to hold individual agency project intake meetings to review and confirm the project needs. We're also going to hold the priority list and programming meetings that are needed to discuss any of the MPO, TPO, or the priority lists. Uh, and as well as SU fund statuses. From mid-August to September, all the programming is going to start to take place. Um, we're going to sort through remaining SU balances um, in the, that are left over in those funding boxes and apply those to any priority list projects. We're also going to work on exchanging of information based on coordination that had taken place throughout July and early August and also follow up on any action items from the project intake meeting and any other meetings for that matter. 
and we're going to perform final coordination for the programming requests so that we can include these to the extent possible within our tentative work program. We're also going to ensure that this information is complete, and this is both an internal and external um, expectation. September 30th is going to be the final day to complete our programming request, so that is the date that we expect all information that has been submitted to be included in our upcoming tentative work program to be completed by our liaisons or by any of our partner agencies. From that day forward, the district will continue to build and balance the five-year plan against allocations, revenues, forecasts, budgetings, and any other program requirements. In the fall-October timeframe, the tentative five-year work program will be complete and ready for the public hearings and submittal for executive re review and for the adoption approval process, which includes the review by central office, state legislature, the Florida Transportation Commission, and ultimately the governor. Again, we hope this is useful information to you, to you, our partners, and what we expect this year in relation to coordinating project needs and the applications within the district, with the district. This was a quick overview, but please take your time and review the expectations. As I mentioned, they are available under Appendix 2 of the LAP guidelines, which are out for review right now. And at this time, if there's any questions, feel free to submit them through the question and answer session or through the chat function in the dashboard. All right, we gave it a few minutes and there haven't been any questions, but feel free, again, the, the guidelines are out there for review and there's also a period for comments to be submitted for that. So if there's anything as you look at it in more detail that you'd like to take note for the district, feel free to submit that. And now I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Heather who's gonna provide information on environmental checklist requirements and NEPA training. Hello, today I'm going to provide a brief overview of the National Environmental Policy Act, usually referred to as NEPA, classes of action with a focus on NEPA requirements for minor projects. NEPA is required to be adhered to for all federal projects. In December 2016, the FDOT acquired a NEPA assignment from the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA. As such, NEPA oversight, activities, and approvals are now the responsibility of FDOT on behalf of FHWA. This is a summary statement from the Memorandum of Understanding between FHWA and FDOT outlining this agreement. Throughout this presentation, I will reference the Environmental Management Office, EMO, which references the district wise Internal Environmental Office, where I work, and the Office of Environmental Management, referred to as OEM, which is our central office's environmental office. Although minor project approval has been delegated to the district, all other NEPA approval, consultation, and policy are produced from OEM in central office. All federal, all federal projects require an environmental document to be produced. Local projects receiving federal funding must meet the same requirements as projects performed by FDOT. Through the local agency program, FDOT administers FHWA funds to local entities for transportation-related projects. Along with this, FDOT is responsible for NEPA oversight and approval of the NEPA document. Although FDOT provides the oversight and approval, the local agency is responsible for all requirements to satisfy the NEPA document. The approval of this document then allows for the project to receive an environmental certification. There are three classes of action for federal projects. The class of action is dependent upon whether the project will have significant impacts. Projects with significant impacts require the development of an environmental impact statement, also known as an EIS. Projects with a question of significance require the development of an environmental assessment, also known as an EA. And projects with no significant impacts are categorically excluded from development of an EA or an EIS. EISs and EAs are generally major projects that involve capacity. Minor projects are generally type one category exclusions and sometimes type two category exclusions. When a project class lacks significant impacts, it can be processed as a CE. In Florida, we have Type 1 and Type 2 CEs. Type 1 CE activities are listed in 23 CFR 771 C or C, 
Common type one CE activities are construction of bicycle, pedestrian lanes, paths, and facilities, emergency repairs, resurfacing, restoration, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and adding shoulder or ox lanes. All CEs must not have significant impacts, but type one CEs must meet one of the listed types of activities and be below certain impact thresholds. If these impact thresholds are tripped, even though the impacts may not be significant by the federal definition of the term, they will require a more expanded amount of documentation and review. These projects may be elevated to a type two CE. The complete list can be found in part one, chapter two of the pd &E manual. Please don't let the name fool you. The pd &E manual contains information pertinent to projects that do not require pd &E. In order to be processed as a type one CE, specific listed CEs must not have adverse impacts to protected species or cultural resources, not require a Coast Guard bridge permit or individual permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, not require programmatic or individual 4 evaluation, have encroachment on the floodplain, or result in displacement of residences or businesses. If a project is on a C or D list as a type 1 CE activity, but does not meet the checklist criteria due to these types of impacts or multiple impacts, coordination needs to occur with the district DMO and central office OEM. The project then may require screening through ETDM, the completion of additional technical studies, coordination with a regulatory agency or the public, and or the preparation of a type 2 CE. For the rest of the presentation, we will focus on the type 1 checklist and its requirements. This is the current checklist. Each item requires supporting documentation to show how it meets the answer provided. We will go over each item and the supporting documentation required. Something to note is that these projects are audited every year. The reviewers will not be familiar with your project or your location and will solely be basing their review on the information provided. This is why providing complete and informative supporting documentation is necessary. The checklist of minor project types has 30 C-list items and 13 D-list items. C-list items 26, 27, 28, and the D-list have particular considerations and you'll see them called out throughout the checklist. The D-list is not commonly used, but C26 through 28 are common types of minor projects. Depending on the project type, one or both of these statements will apply. Before moving forward with any checklist item, this statement needs to be verified as true. A narrative must be provided as to how the project meets these statements. If there is a question as if to a project does not meet these standards, please consult with DMO as early as possible. Here are some example statements. As you can see, the statements reference the type of project and why it meets the constraint. Presented are very simple projects, but for a more complex project where there may be a question as to if these issues exist, please provide more detail. The first item on the checklist is about right-of-way acquisition. Will the project require additional right-of-way? Typically, only minor right-of-way acquisitions are allowable for a type 1 CE. If any right-of-way is being acquired, a short description of the amount and type of acquisition will be necessary. If any relocations are anticipated for a project, then coordination with district CMO will need to occur to discuss how the project will move forward. Additionally, if lands are to be acquired from the state's Acquisition and Restoration Council, contact the district CMO and we will consult on OEM on your behalf. Here's an example of documentation to support the minor amount of right-of-way acquisition. As you can see here is a short description with a visual. A screenshot of the plans with the right-of-way to be acquired highlighted and a short narrative provides the information needed. If the strip of land is long and it's not practical to show the plans, you can provide an aerial, such as an image from Google Earth, that has the area outlined. Wetland impacts. Wetland well, impacts are focused on impacts that are federally jurisdictional. FDP and water management district permits do not apply to this question. If there are no wetlands present or there are no impacts, please provide a narrative and a wetlands map with the project limits delineated with that information. If a permit has been acquired, please submit the permit to EMO as well as our programming office. If a standard permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is required, contact the district EMO as this may have class of action implications for the project. Additionally, Please understand that not needing a permit or meeting an exemption only speaks to wetland impacts. 
The other items on the checklist, although some are covered by the agencies as part of the permitting process, are standalone issues and still need to be addressed in absence of a permit. For example, there may be no wetlands to be impacted, but you could still be impacting upland species such as the Florida scrub jet. As you can see in this, this example, in this scenario, there is a wetland along the project limits, but the explanation of the where the work is to be performed supports the checklist designation of no wetland impacts. And in this example, you can see there are no undeveloped lands. This image, along with a brief explanation, is sufficient. Coast Guard Bridge Permits. If work is being performed on a bridge, but no permit is required, please provide this information. If U.S. Coast Guard consultation was required to determine the bridge was not jurisdictional, please provide that communication. If a U.S. Coast Guard permit is required, please contact District DMO. A, local, a location map is a good supporting document for this item. Floodplains. If the, flood pl if the project has impacts requiring floodplain compensation, that's considered encroachment on the floodplain. As the statement reads, there are exceptions for bridges and bike and pedestrian facilities. If there is a floodplain encroachment that does not meet the exceptions, please contact the district's email. If floodplains are present but there is no impact, information on how this is determined will be necessary. The FEMA Flood Map Service Center is a good resource for identifying any floodplain in the project area or to provide evidence that there is no floodplain in the project area. Like shown in this example, a screenshot from the mapping service with the project limits delineated should provide, be provided along with the narrative discussing the project's floodplain involvement or lack thereof. If there is a drainage report prepared for the project that includes a discussion on floodplains, this can be submitted instead. Wild and scenic rivers and study rivers are rivers that are under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. The only wild and scenic river located in District 5 is a portion of the Wakaiba River. If the project occurs within a quarter mile of the Wakaiba River or adjacent to its tributary, please contact District EMO to discuss how to proceed. There are no study rivers in or near D5. The National Park Service Wild and Scenic Rivers page, unfortunately, there is no fun search function, but you can zoom into your project location using landmarks. As the Wakaiba River is the only wild and scenic river in D5, for many entities, this river is not going to be an issue. For entities that could have a project within the constrained areas of the river, this, along with Google Earth, can verify if you're working in an area that would need additional consideration. An image showing the location of the project versus the location of the river should be provided. If a project is to occur within a quarter mile of the Wakaiba or adjacent to its tributary, please contact the district's email. We'll have to contact OEM on your behalf to discuss the project. The Nationwide Rivers Inventory, or NRI, are also rivers under the authority of the National Park Service. There are several rivers on the NRI, though it is typically not the entirety of the river that is listed. These include the Wislacuchi, Tomoka, Kanawahatchee, St. John's, and Akawaha. If the project occurs within a quarter mile of the map portions of these rivers, please contact District EMO to discuss how to proceed. Documentation of no involvement can be provided two ways. The first is by going to the NRI website, finding the project location, and providing an image showing the proximity to these resources. This is best when there's a linear water body along the project area. On the NRI page, you can enter the latitude and longitude to get to your project area. The second option is to define your project limits in Google Earth, create a quarter mile reference, and provide the image showing that there are no rivers in the area. Now, if the project is within a quarter mile of one of these rivers, please contact the district CMO to discuss what needs to be provided. A protected species evaluation is required for all projects. This can be as simple as a desktop review to a full natural resources evaluation report. The extent should be commensurate with the project location, type, and impacts. This review should be performed by an environmental professional that is knowledgeable regarding protected species, federal effect determination language and requirements, and associated regulations. The NRA guidance document, as well as the protected species chapter of the PDE manual, can be, provide guidance on this requirement. I can also furnish examples upon request. 
If the project is found to have a may affect determination for a protected species and require a biological opinion from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service, then please contact the district FEMO. This may have implications on the class of action. Additionally, the may affect consultation with the resource agencies should be performed through the formal Section 7 consultation with OEM. Section 4F was designed by FHWA to protect public land. This can apply to public parks, recreation areas, wildlife and waterfowl refuges, and historic sites. The most common 4F involvement that lot projects have is with public parks and recreation areas. If your project involves any of these resources, even if the resource is owned by the same agency, some type of 4F evaluation will be necessary. Involvement can include entering, modifying, staging within, or changing access to resources, as well as other type of involvement. Early coordination with district DMO is recommended to determine the appropriate level of documentation, as the process can be lengthy in some circumstances. If the project requires a programmatic or individual Section 4F evaluation, then the class of action will most likely be increased to a Type 2 CE. There are public land files available on the Florida Geographic Data Library, FGDL, and the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, FNAI, that map public lands that are useful, though not all will be on these. Activity fields such as baseball, soccer, and other sports that are open for public use and publicly owned can also be 4F resources. This example shows a project area where there are no public lands along the project limits. In this case, an aerial image delineating the project limits along with the data used provides some new documentation to support no potential forest resources present. When there is a potential forest resource present in the project area, but the project is staying within the existing right-of-way and not affecting access or any other aspect of the resource, an image showing the project limits, data use, name a resource, along with the narrative is needed to document that there will be no use of the resource. If there is a question as to if the project will have any use of the resource, please contact the district CMO. Cultural resources. Cultural resources documentation is required for all projects regardless of location or type. Documentation may consist of a brief form or an extensive survey report, depending on the improvements proposed in historical or archeological resources that may be nearby. The cultural resources review and documentation must be performed by a cultural resources professional that meets specific professional qualifications to conduct such work. The resulting form or survey report must be provided to the district's cultural resources coordinator who will submit it to the Florida State Historic Preservation Officer, the SHPO, for concurrence on the potential effects to cultural resources. If the project is found to have an adverse effect on a cultural resource, then EMO will coordinate with OEM on how the project is to proceed. This most likely will result in the class of action being increased to a Type 2 CE. Minor activities do not generally require noise analysis, although there are some exceptions. For minor projects where the vertical or horizontal alignment is to be appreciably changed, meaning the distance between the roadway and the property is cut by half, or in an auxiliary lane, of a half a mile or greater is being added, a noise analysis is required. The noise analysis could result in noise abatement measures being found reasonable and feasible, which may require noise barrier being added to the project. Contamination. The potential to interact with any known contamination sites located adjacent to the project area must be considered on all projects. Contamination evaluation requires a narrative and some supporting information to be uploaded to the checklist. Not all projects will have known contamination sites adjacent. The FDP map direct site is a great resource to find documented sites. For example, as you can see here, there are no known contamination sites documented along the project area. So this image with a simple narrative is sufficient. But when contamination sites are present, like in this example, they must be evaluated against the proposed work to determine if there is a potential for interaction. A contaminant plume can come into the right-of-way or be close enough that if the project requires dewatering, it could bring the contaminant into the project. If it is thought that there is potential for contamination interaction, then a plan of how to the can this contamination will be handled during construction will need to be provided. In some cases, the plan could be that the county's contamination program will provide construction support. 
you know, to where the contamination is located and who to contact for construction support should be placed in the plans and provided with the contamination evaluation. If the assessment finds that there is no potential for interaction, please provide a narrative with a rationale as to why there will be no interaction. This narrative, along with plan excerpts, FDP screenshots, or other relative material should be provided. I can provide examples of evaluation and plan notes for minor projects upon request. Lastly, planning consistency. Every project needs to show planning consistency. At this time, we have been providing the SIP page from our work program to satisfy this requirement. As this has been acceptable, we will continue to do this when filling out the checklist for approval. If in the future, a more developed planning consistency is required, then this requirement will be passed to the local agency to provide. As you can see, federal projects are required to assess and consider a fair amount of different environmental impacts. I would encourage you to consult a checklist when considering and planning projects to see what issues you may have. This information can be informative for scoping, discovering class of action red flags, and deciding if SLAP is right for your project. Additionally, keep in mind that any amount of federal money applied to any phase of the project will federalize the project and all NEPA requirements will apply. For how federal funding will impact other phases, please consult with the appropriate department staff. I realize that this is a lot of information. We will be making this presentation available to you and your staff for reference. I'm happy to answer any questions, provide examples, feedback, recommendations, or any other information. Are there any non-project specific questions at this time?
Hello. Hi, yes. Uh, please excuse the technical difficulty. Can you all confirm that you can hear us now? Hopefully we're loud and clear now. All right, thank you so much, appreciate it. I think Heather's gonna catch up in the last question. We're gonna reread the question and Heather's gonna provide the answer one again. The last one about the list. If we are naming a consultant for planning services, can we have the consultant prepare the checklist for a municipality with full knowledge that the agency will have to sign off on it? Yes, that's uh, not a problem at all. Whoever, doesn't matter if it's the agency or consultant that puts it together. Okay. And what is the best web resource to check for environmental data? There are a couple of good web resources. The FGDL as well as MapDirect have a wide variety of um, uh, shape files and candies and information available, but we can also put together a list of good resources to distribute. Okay, that's everything for now. All right, now I'll hand it over to Lisa Busher to discuss the lab guidelines. Heather. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules this afternoon to join us. I'm going to be closing out this afternoon's webinar by updating you on the district's local agency program LAP guidelines. During the various partnering meetings, comment period, and our workshop regarding the district's LAP policy, we received a lot of feedback and we took it all into serious consideration. We revised the title of our document from a policy to guidelines to clarify that we're not making any changes to the policy set out in the LAP manual. The LAP manual has intentional gray areas to allow district flexibility to meet the needs of their program while remaining within the confines of federal regulations and requirements. The district's intent from the beginning has been to formally document how we operate in those gray areas with the goal of reducing informational gaps both within the district and with our local agency partners. Speaking of from the beginning, let's take a moment to look back at the efforts that have gone into developing these guidelines. Believe it or not, these guidelines have been in the making for almost seven years. When I joined the district in March of 2013, I was almost immediately tasked with documenting the district's processes as it pertained to LAP. I very quickly learned that the district lap process was a giant elephant that was going to have to be tackled one bite at a time. Between 2013 and 2018, the district took lots of little steps to take the resources provided in and through the lap manual and improve existing district processes or develop district processes where they did not exist. It was a piecemeal effort, a little bit here, a little bit there, and was not improving the efficiency of the program like we wanted. In spring of 2018, at the direction of senior management, we began a formal assessment of the district lab program. We assembled the primary staff involved in district lab administration, local programs, work program, planning, design, right-of-way, and construction, and began a series of internal workshops with everyone in the same room to identify the areas of strength and opportunities for improvement within the district processes. We looked at historical performance and individual project data to determine strategic focus areas. Through these workshops and data analysis, we developed a survey which we sent to the other districts in an effort to learn their best practices and lessons learned through their LAP administration processes. All of this information was utilized to develop the draft LAP policy that was presented through a series of partnering meetings in late 2018 and early last year. Following those meetings, we spent four plus months collecting your questions and comments on the policy. In general, the questions and comments could be divided into four focus areas, certification and performance management, training, compliance, and programming. In October of last year, we held an incubator workshop where we took the recurring questions and comments and posed them to you, our local agency partners, for your input on how to address the issues. We spent the last two months utilizing the information collected from comments received in the incubator event to revise the policy to the guidelines that we recently published for public review. The guidelines have been divided into six parts. Part one, local agency program certification and performance management. Part two, training. Part three, compliance. 
Part 4, Programming, Part 5, Exceptions, and Part 6, Guideline Revisions. Sections 1 through 4 tie directly to chapters in the LAP manual. In addition to the fundamental LAP components, we compiled essential department information that is necessary for successful delivery of LAP projects, which I will discuss later. These appendices address the concerns of a lack of understanding or shortfall of information as it relates to the development of the department's work program, programming expectations, and work program calendar key dates. Part one of the guidelines, Local Agency Program Certification and Performance Management, ties to chapter two of the LAP manual. This section confirms that the district reserves full certification for agencies within the district that have demonstrated appropriate staff qualifications and capabilities, having met performance expectations required for LAP for the three-year certification cycle. It defines limited experience as successful administration of three or less federal aid projects within a three-year period or not producing three or more projects within the three-year period. Finally, it confirms that to be certified, an agency must demonstrate that they meet staff qualifications. Agencies with past LAP projects must have met the performance expectations required for LAP project administration as identified within these guidelines and within the LAP manual. Part two, training, also ties to chapter two of the LAP manual. We received a significant number of requests for additional training, as well as for varied formats for training. This was valuable information, and we're excited to supplement the training that is available and required through the LAP manual with district go-to meetings and online forums, webinars, lunch and learn sessions, and computer-based training modules. This meeting is being held in webinar format versus in-person based largely on this feedback. We hope to begin offering additional training through these various formats as the year progresses. If there are specific topics that you would like to focus on, please let us know. We want to provide the information you feel is necessary and beneficial to successful delivery of LAP projects. Part three, which again relates to LAP Manual Chapter Two, focuses on compliance. We received a lot of positive feedback regarding project task teams and quarterly meetings, so that has remained as a part of the guidelines. We also heard that we often meeting performance expectations, but that it is not clear what those expectations are. Part three incorporates agency performance expectations, which include the following items. Agency commitment and representation, establishing and maintaining lockdown commitments, complete and maintain project schedules, adhering to set milestones, due dates, lockdown commitments, and production development. Part four, programming, moves away from chapter two of the LAP manual, connecting to chapters five, 10, 18, 19, and 21. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus on the most significant change in these guidelines versus the previously published policy. We receive robust feedback regarding the district's decision to limit programming to construction phases only. This was based on the practices of district four, but we heard very clearly that this was not a good fit for district five agencies. Many of you agreed that placing a minimum threshold in construction made sense and recommended that we consider doing the same for all other project phases. The guidelines confirm that the district will continue to program design, right-of-way, and construction with CEI. Based on your recommendations, each phase will be subject to a minimum threshold, which will be $250,000 per phase. Although the district will no longer be programming study phases, we will continue to provide technical support when requested. It is important to keep in mind if a local agency has a major project that requires a PD&E and wants to remain federally eligible for a future phase, coordination with our district should occur. Part five outlines how and when an agency can request an exception to the guidelines. Exception requests shall include, at a minimum, what exception is being requested, who is requesting the exception, why the exception is being requested, and how the project will proceed if the exception is not granted. Approvals will be considered by the district secretary prior to programming during the development of the five-year work program through the cycle that was presented by Kathy earlier in the webinar. 
Part 6 simply outlines that guidelines will be updated on an annual basis by the district. Updates may stem from lap manual updates, collaboration with our partners, and or department modifications for the objective of delivering lap projects in a more expeditious and efficient manner. The accompanying appendices, which I will discuss in a moment, are subject to change at any time. Should you have any comments or suggestions for the guidelines, you can provide those to me as a district's lab administrator. The six parts we just discussed represent seven pages of the 52-page guidance document. The majority of the document focuses on providing references to better understand the department processes and major impact areas within the LAP program. Our biggest takeaway from the open comment period and incubator workshop is that the district repeatedly talks about things such as work program development cycle and lockdown, but there is no place that you, as local agency staff, can go to get a better understanding what the term means, why they are important, and how the district approaches them. We realize that understanding is a major component of success, so we developed a series of appendices that start high level, explaining the overall work program development cycle, and then move deeper through the cycle components, the flow of application intake and programming, the process for lap certification, and how lockdown is established. Realizing that different people have different ways of visualizing information, we've tr tried to provide in different formats, some with limited detail and others with significant detail. Additionally, with the help of some of our subject matter experts, we created reference materials related to right-of-way acquisition, environmental activities, as well as considerations related to the LAP agreement and how LAP agreement activities tie to lockdown. We created various project schedule templates that summarize the activities by phase that go into meeting lockdown. We've tried to address as many elements that impact lockdown as possible in an effort to answer, why is my project schedule so important? Last, but certainly not least, we've provided a sample project finance plan, which we hope will be a resource for you when applying for projects. While we intend to review and update the six main parts of the guidelines annually, these appendices may be modified at any time in effort to provide the most up-to-date and meaningful reference information. Hopefully, you've already had a chance to review the guidelines via the link previously sent via email. For your convenience, we've added the link to the presentation, which you can download from the handouts within the webinar. Comments will be accepted until Monday, February 17th. Again, I'd like to thank you for your time today. We hope that the district lab guidelines will become a centralized resource of reference material, reducing the informational gaps brought to our attention during the last 18 months. And at this time, we'll address any questions that we've received during this presentation. Okay, so we do have one uh, question that has come in uh, regarding the fact that the district will no longer be programming studies and whether there will be any exception to that if it's something that benefits the state highway system. Um, you know, section, uh, there is a section that relates to exceptions and, you know, anything in the policy could be subject to an exception on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, the MPOs have the ability to do planning studies through their unified planning work program, so they could take that into consideration. Um, and if it is a study with on, on the state highway system um, or state road network, we would also go through the MPO process and programming those studies, and we could manage it within the department. Okay. The question is, when is the next LAP training course being offered? 
I guess it, uh, we would probably need a little bit more specific information in terms as to what type of LAP training course. Uh, we have been going through our biannual LAP uh, professional services checklist training. Uh, we had two sessions of that last month, and we do have another session of that that will be taking place on February 19th at the Turnpike. Uh, if you're interested in participating in that training, there is still space available, and you can register on the training page of the LAP website. Um, outside of that, there's nothing else specific that is planned at this point in time, uh, but as I mentioned, we do plan within the district to start putting together some trainings that we'll put out in various formats. I just don't have any of the specifics on that at this time. And if you have any suggestions, please let Lisa know. Mm -hmm. We have one more question. Is the District LAP CEI Continuing Services contract available for use by local agencies that have full LAP certification? At this point in time, based on the fact that we only have one contract and it has limited capacity to it, we are trying to limit the use of that contract to those agencies that either don't have experience procuring contracts on their own um, or that would have um, difficulty going through the process. Those agencies that have full certification have been certified with the expectation that they have the ability to procure those contracts on their own. Uh, we are currently kind of in a pilot period with that uh, contract as well. Uh, we just are in the process of executing our first task work orders under the contract. If everything goes as we anticipate with the contract, then we do plan to uh, procure some additional contracts and at that point in time, we would look to make it more broadly available. But right now, we just we do have limited capacity because we just have a single contract. And there is one comment. Uh, there is a desire for more ADA training as soon as possible. Thank you for that. So uh, we will make note of the ADA training uh, request, and we'll see what we can put together for that. All right, at this time, we're going to open it up for questions that anyone may have regarding anything that was um, shown to you today. Um. There is uh, one more question. This is for Kathy Alexander. Transmitting project applications has been challenging in previous years. Firewalls and file sizes have made it difficult to provide electronic files to SDOT staff. We are. We have asked to send applications several times because they cannot be located after they've been submitted. How do you prefer completed project applications to be submitted? Also, please describe SDOT processes for receiving and filing project applications. We are aware of some of those challenges. We're actually in the process of working through some of those now. We have meetings in the upcoming week to actually lay down that workflow. Um, we have started coordinating. We have set up a centralized uh, depository that we'll be sharing with everybody once we um, document what the workflow is going to be, where we hope where applicants will be able to submit their application. And what's going to happen on the DOTN is once that application is received, the applicant will receive a confirmation that it has been received. At that point, it will then get routed to the proper unit or group, which is our 4P project manager group, and a project manager will be assigned to that application, at which point the project manager will then reach out to the applicant to establish that point of contact and let them know that we have received the information, they'll be doing a preliminary review and then reaching out in the future for any additional information. So it's something that we're aware of. Um, we'll definitely be reaching out and see if there's any kind of um, ideas or any other kind of feedback from others. Um, we, like I said, we do have the central depository now and we have a general idea of how this is going to be tracked and logged on the DOT end. But we do have a meeting coming up to actually to work through those details and actually set up the workflow. So we can provide that as a draft at a later time. The other thing that I'll add on to that, many of you may have heard about GAP or the grant application program, which is going to be the replacement for LAPIT. The long-term goal for that program, as is in the name, is to be the grant application system. So once that uh, is more broadly rolled out, 
um, there is the very strong likelihood uh, that all applications um, for any grant funding, be it state funding or federal funding, is going to go through that system. Um, as it stands right now, uh, STOP, uh, the small county um, program applications are going through that system, uh, as well as SunTrail applications and Safe Route to School applications. So that is already being used for some of the programs and, again, will be more widely rolled out in the future. Is this webinar something that needs to be documented for certification? No. It's strictly informational. It's not a requirement for certification. No. That's all the questions I have right now. Awesome. Well, we're going to leave it open um, for you guys for two or three more minutes to submit your questions. Um, but we really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, again, the handout is available. The links are there. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, everyone's contact is um, name was in the presentation for who gave it. So you can contact them directly. And thank you all for joining. All right, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for joining.